before introducing our final speaker, uh, the organizing committee for this symposium wanted to give a special thank you to the young woman who has really been behind all of this. Um, without Kara Fisher, this symposium would not have happened. She's put together, she's dealt with almost all of the logistical matters having to do with the symposium, and she's really the reason that all of us are in the room today. So, Kara, I hope you'll accept this small token. Of I am pleased to introduce our final speaker of the symposium. Larry Crowder is Science Director at the Center for Ocean Solutions, a professor of biology at Stanford's Hopkins Marine Station, and a senior fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. At the Center for Ocean Solutions, COS, Larry, was, uh, Larry orchestrates many working groups that are delving into climate change, coastal hypoxia, marine pathogens, and other areas. His research centers on predation and food web interactions, mechanisms underlying recruitment variation in fishes, population and food web modeling in conservation biology, and inter interdisciplinary approaches to marine conservation. Prior to joining COS, Larry was a professor of marine biology at Duke University. We are honored to have Larry provide today's closing remarks and we will move any questions and answers to the reception immediately following. <laughs> I know how dangerous it is to get between an audience and their beer and wine, so I will <laughs> try to make this fast. Um, and I do have a PowerPoint and it includes some of the issues that I wanted to share with you, but also I hope is responsive to um, what you heard presented over the past two days. Let me say uh, uh, again, thank you so much for all of you, all of you for coming. Uh, we actually heard 25 speakers who represented at least six or eight or 10 different disciplines. Um, this doesn't happen very often at the meetings that I go to, so uh, hopefully this will look back to this as a watershed meeting. Um, we, we talked a lot about ecosystem-based management, and this is the compass definition. You've probably seen it before. But the focus is very anthropocentric, actually. It's about maintaining ecosystems that are healthy, productive, and resilient. And for the first time, this is circa 2005, um, emphasized ecosystems include people, something the Native Hawaiians have known forever, uh, and a lot of Pacific Island nations have known forever. But the question is, how can we do this work and fully include uh, people and their interactions with the biophysical system? Uh, the first approach that a lot of scientists took to thinking about ecosystem-based management, given all the negative impacts that people have, was to try to set aside parts of the ocean where we reduce the impacts of people. And of course, the Marine Protected Area Movement um, made, has made some substantial progress, but in fact, even if we got to this, the stated goal of 10% of marine protected areas, there's still what, the question, what happens in the other 90%? Um, and I, I think that we're gonna have to achieve conservation goals in that other 90% as well. Um, a lot of the data that we've talked about here has been biophysical data about, uh, about where the fishes are or where the seabirds are or whatever. Um, and there's very, very little data on where the humans are on the ocean. And this, this uh, paper is one classic example from uh, Kevin St. Martin where he mapped the, the uh, places that fishermen operate at sea and this is in, uh, in the Northwest Atlantic in the US, Cape Cod is in the bottom there, um, to the villages, to the cities where they live on land. And so what he's making the case here with graphically is that people have places on land where they live, where there are communities, economies, and livelihoods, and people have places at sea where there are communities and livelihoods and so on. And it's not just a matter of understanding where humans do certain things at sea, but how those activities link back to things like community uh, and livelihood and well-being of the people in those communities. And so an ultimate goal might be sustainability of the biophysical system and the human communities that depend upon it. Um, one of the issues that was discussed a lot here was about the role of big animals in oceans and how we go about protecting 
uh, highly mobile pelagic predators. Um, and I guess one of the things I wanted to emphasize, which wasn't said here, is sometimes we protect whales or turtles or seabirds because they have some protection under US law because they're marine mammals or whatever. What we're discovering more and more is these animals play disproportionate roles in the function of marine food webs. Um, and so it's not just they're endangered, it's not just they're sharks and we love sharks, but sharks play a disproportionate role in how marine food webs work. And so protecting them, in fact, protects the entire ecosystem. One of the problems with protecting these animals compared to some invertebrate that glues its butt down to a rock is that they move, okay? And people have argued you keep marine protected areas are worthless for animals that move. And I hope that we've discussed in the last two days um, vehicles by which that might be useful. Um, I, I'm on, uh, we're, we have this working group through the Center for Ocean Solutions that's gonna be adding to the work that's been reported on here about making the science case for uh, mobile marine protected areas. And the discussion here was to begin getting the lawyers and policy people to think under the current law, under current regulations, what can we do from a legal and policy perspective to um, allow this potentially disruptive technology, something that would be entirely new, uh, to improve management. So this kind of data that you often see, it's usually plotted like the upper left-hand graph where you have a track of a turtle over a latitude and longitude over a year. To try to relate it to its environment, you put it against a snapshot of the environment, but in fact, if that track is a year, the environment's changing really dramatically. So a snapshot is wrong. If it's the yearly average, if it's March 14th, it's wrong. What you need to do is relate the animal's movements to the dynamics of the ocean movement at the same time. People have said this over and over, pelagic habitats move. And the organisms that we're interested in that are top predators in the ocean, uh, those organisms that we traditionally have thought we can't protect with marine protected areas, live in these habitats where there are fronts and eddies and convergences and so on uh, that can be re monitored remotely and we know those habitats are very dynamic. The other feature of dynamic ocean management is human activities move. So where the humans operate, is in different places, sometimes in association with those same physical oceanographic features that the animals operate in. So the perspective of dynamic ocean management is the animals are moving around out there seasonally and in response to oceanographic variability, but so are the humans. And so the interactions between the animals and the humans are dynamic in space and time. What's amazing is that management and policy stack. Okay, we're up on the rocks here. We're not able to move management and policy. And when people talk about managing a system like the oceans or the pelagic critters in the oceans and the interaction with people with uh, negotiations that take decades, we're clearly going to have trouble <laughs> with moving ahead with this. And so the big question is, could pelagic uh, protected areas be effective conservation tools, not just for single species, but for suites of species relative to suites of human activities that might occur in those places and occur in those places over various times. So the, the vision of dynamic ocean management, which, which we had as scientists and that kind of led to the development of this working group, is thinking about, and it goes, sort of goes back to what Daniel was talking about at the beginning, um, the potential that there could be pelagic protected areas that could move seasonally or even daily uh, based on tagging and oceanographic data for animal movements and maybe on the dynamics of human activities so that the protection is actually programmed to move relative to some well-developed statistical models that predict where the animals are or using remote sensing data where the conflicts are with human activities. And uh, Phil's talk about our increasing ability to sense where things are, both the animals and the human activities, could potentially fuel this potential. So traditional spatial management is static in the sense that we establish marine protected areas and we draw lines on maps. Fish don't know about lines on maps. Uh, they often lack, lack the flexibility to follow dynamic ocean processes, whether it's the seasonal movement of the North Pacific Convergence Zone, which is a thousand kilometers from season to season, or the movement of these physical oceanographic features over periods of climate change that are likely to occur. I mean, Elliot Hazen just published a paper in Nature Climate Change where he used all that top data that we've been talking about to do habitat modeling for 23 species uh, in the North Pacific, and then ran that against the climate change models for the North Pacific out 50 or 100 years and said, 
okay, so we know where their habitats are, what they associate with, where are those locations going to be? If you make a marine protected area now, even if it's a seasonally dynamic marine protected area, and you specify it with latitude and longitude, it may not be in the same place, even in a short period of time. We catch fish with real-time technology, but management, again, is static. So we propose this, uh, this definition for uh, dynamic ocean management, which is a little bit like Daniel's definition. We're talking about a spatial management marine systems that's dynamic in space and time uh, or triggered by specific events that you monitor. Uh, the, the mathematics of doing these modeling, uh, these modeling approaches is now pretty straightforward that allows us to integrate the biological, oceanographic, social, and economic data to look for basically the train wrecks that are likely to occur or could occur between human activities and species of concern. Um, and, the, and the adjustments of management might have to be over short time scales of seasons, months, and weeks. And, and I appreciate the Coast Guard uh, officer telling us this is really hard to do, that even like something that's not straight lines on maps is really difficult. But fishermen, at least on the big vessels, know pretty exactly where they are. And the closed areas could pop up every day on their chart relative to where they are, uh, and they could be in different places. And so the dynamic ocean management idea is different, and David Heirenbach wrote the paper uh, that people have referred to before in 2000, where the, the approach would be time area closures that move in response to both human and animal movements, um, and those movements can be modeled or monitored in a way that allows us to provide the appropriate protection uh, to endangered species or protected species while minimizing the impact on fisheries. This has already been used to protect whales moving in and out of the Boston, Boston Ship Channel, where not only has the ship channel been moved statically to where the interactions on average are likely to be less, but there are listening posts out there that say, tell you when there are whales in the vicinity. And the rules change about how, how fast you move through this channel, depending on whether whales are actually present. So what we can do is conduct human activities with real-time technology, um, but again, we have to figure out how from a policy and legal perspective uh, we can actually do this. In other words, do the current provisions of the law allow us to do this or not? Um, one case study that I don't think was mentioned here, or at least the graphic wasn't shown more than once or twice, is Turtle Watch, which NOAA has come up with. And basically, this is the longline fishery in Hawaii, which is constrained to a total catch of loggerhead sea turtles, and when they exceed their catch, they get shut down. So there's motivation for the fishermen to catch as few loggerheads as possible. This is a device which just uh, depends, uses the uh, uh, notion that turtles respond to temperature, uh, and so what they do is forecast where it would be risky to fish. Set your long lines if you don't want to catch loggerhead sea turtles, and the, the compliance of this is not required by law or anything. There's no fines if you don't do it. But the fishermen use this to make setting decisions um, and shift their distributions to reduce the interactions with turtles. And it may not be because they love turtles, they, it may be because they don't want to hit their limit for the season and be shut down. So sometimes to get compliance, you might not need regulations, but you need incentives. Why would they use this? Because there's a risk they get shut down. So the question is, are there win-win solutions here? And I think Alistair did a good job of making the case that if we do this right, we can protect species of concern or complexes of species of concern with a minimum of impact on the fishermen. And this is a much better deal to try to present to the fishermen saying, yeah, we're looking to protect these suite of species that are uh, protected under the Endangered Species Act, but we're also looking to protect fishing opportunities. And the vast area that was closed in the Hawaii longline case was based on there's a turtle in there sometime at some time during the year over this big area. We could be a lot more precise where the risks are and leave other areas open to fishing. And Alistair showed that in his examples. And that's likely to be a better negotiating position with the fishing industry than saying we're just going to close the entire area. So some of the things that the working group will be working on is to try to figure out uh, how to build out the science case for this where we will include catch data, bycatch data, oceanographic data, and so on in the models, um, and try to come up with uh, uh, the scientific case for areas or times when human activities could be constrained, not necessarily closures, but ge different gears or whatever. Um, fishermen would obviously be uh, involved in this from the very beginning so that they understand 
that we're trying to protect species but also protect fishing opportunities um, and by integrating multiple types of biophysical and human dimensions data, we're hoping we can be way more precise than we are now about trying to manage pelagic species um, and consider the impacts of the fisheries and on fishermen in terms of profits and losses. So there are three points that I wanted to make, or four, to wrap up here. Understanding resilience of these coupled social ecological systems like Natalie talked about requires uh, a lot of interdisciplinary discussion. And all these disciplines often live in different silos. They certainly live in different departments and universities. And the language and the jargon and the culture of each of those is quite different. So it's a challenge to, to do this uh, work, but I think it's going to be important for us to push ahead with that. One of the issues discussed at this meeting, which are brought up all over this meeting, was where do you work? Do you work in the open sea? Do you work in the EEZ? Do you work in state waters? Um, I think the open sea, although there was a lot of discussion of it, is a very hard place to start from a policy perspective, and it might be more reasonable to do this in an EEZ. I also think we shouldn't, like, we're gonna try to do the world here. Um, we should let experiments roll out. We take a distributed approach to learning how to do this, both from a scientific and a policy perspective, and if we have some successes, then we might, or failures, then we might be able to learn from those and, and uh, push out this approach further. Um, uh, I'm a, I have two metaphors that I want to talk about here. This, this goofy thing on the top left is an Osprey aircraft. Um, the US military wanted this thing because it could do heavy lifting. It could take off vertically from a deck of a carrier. It could rotate and fly uh, at pretty high speeds going forward. It can carry uh, uh, men and equipment and so on, it can land in a war zone. Uh, but this thing is aerodynamically unstable. It cannot be flown without computers flying it, okay? It has to, so uh, in order to achieve a mission, which they wanted to do, they had to design a system that can't fly. And the only way it can fly is by detecting how it's moving and the computer rapidly changes various sort of controls and so on. So that the pilot flies it going up and forward, but it doesn't adjust, he doesn't adjust the attitude in real time. So it could be that we need to be thinking about autonomous systems for management where the policy is not, oh, well, you, you call together the committee and you decide what to do. You say, under these circumstances, this is how it changes. Okay, and those things are prescribed. Um, most of you flew to the Bay Area, uh, or many of you flew to the Bay Area or fly in and out of the Bay Area. The top uh, graph right there is the flight patterns into San Jose and San Francisco and Oakland, uh, and that's a very static view. In fact, I see all those lines crossing each other and say, ooh, you know, we're gonna kill here. But in real time, we manage that airspace by monitoring, by constant communication, by making adjustments, uh, and we may have to think about managing marine resources in that way as well. In other words, not the traditional static way, but in a very dynamic way. Um, and again, the technology, if it's not ready for prime time, it's damn close to being able to do this. So one of the things that we need to escape is this thinking outside the box problem. Um, one of my fellow faculty members at Duke, Joe Bonaventura, who's a really interesting guy, one time when I was saying, talking to him, I said, we need to think outside the box, and Joe said, what box? Okay, and so I think that um, one of the things that the challenge to all of us is to say, how do we attack this problem in maybe a totally unconventional way compared to what we've done before? Thank you.